Chapter 1. The Badlands Rafe Severance set his sights on the target and called the Ice Hare to him. A moment of disorientation followed, where the world dropped out of focus like a great dark stone sinking to the bottom of a lake. Then, in the shortest space that a moment could be, he perceived the animal's heart. The light, sounds, and odors of the Badlands slid away, leaving nothing but the white of blood in the ice hare's chest and the hummingbird flutter of its heart. Slowly, deliberately, Rafe angled his bow away from the target. The arrow cracked the freezing air like a word spoken out loud. As his iron blade shot past the hare, the creature's head came up, and it sprang for cover in a cushion of black sedge. Take the shot again, Dre said. You sent that wide on purpose. Rafe lowered his bow and glanced over at his older brother. Dre's face was partially shaded by his fox hood, but the firm set of his mouth was clear. Rafe paused, considered arguing, then shrugged and reset his footing on the tundra. It never felt good deceiving Dre. Fingers smoothing down the backing of his horn and sinew bow, Rafe looked over the wind-blown flats of the Badlands. Panes of ice already lay thick over the melt ponds. In the flattened colt grass beneath Rafe's feet, hoarfrost grew as silently and insidiously as mold on second-day bread. The few trees that managed to survive in the gravelly floodplain were wind-crippled blackstone pines and prostrate hamlock. Directly ahead lay a shadow draw filled with loose rocks and scrubby bushes that looked as though and bonny as moose antlers. Rafe dipped his gaze, a fraction lowered to the brown lichen mat surrounding a pile of wet rocks. Even on a morning as cold as this, the lick was still running. As Rafe watched, another ice air popped its head, cheeks puffing, ears trembling. It held its position, listening for danger. It wanted the salt in the lick. Game animals came from leagues around to drink at the tickle of salt water that bled across the rocks in the draw. Temp said the lick welled up from the underground stream. Rafe raised his bow, slid an arrow from the quiver at his waist. In one smooth motion, he knocked the iron arrowhead against the plate and drew his bowstring back to his chest. The hair swiveled its head. Its dark eyes looked straight at Rafe. Too late. Rafe already had the creature's heart in his sights. Hissing the string, Rafe let the arrow fly. Fingers of the ice mist parted. A faint hiss sounded, and the arrow had shot straight into the hare's ribcage. If the creature made a sound, Rafe didn't hear it. Carried back by the force of the blow, it collapsed into the lick. That's three to you, none to me. Dre's voice sounded flat, resigned. Rafe pretended to check his bow for hairpin cracks. Come on, let's shoot at targets. No more hares are going to show now you've sent a live one into the lick. Dre reached out and touched Rafe's bow. You could have used a smaller head on the arrow, you know. You're supposed to kill the hare, not disembowel it. Rafe looked up. Dre was grinning, just a bit. Relieved, Rafe grinned back at him. Dre was two years older than he, better at everything an older brother should be better at. Up until this winter, he had been better at shooting, too. A lot better. Abruptly, Rafe tucked his bow into his belt and ran for the draw. Tim never let them shoot anything purely for sport, and the hares had to be taken back to camp, skinned and roasted. The pelts were Rafe's. Another couple more, and he'd have enough for a winter coat for Effie. Not that Effie had much use for a coat. She was the only eight-year-old in Clan Black Ale who didn't enjoy running around in the snow. Frowning, Rafe twisted the arrows free from the twig-thin bones of the hare's ribcage. Careful not to break the shafts, timber straight enough for the arrows was rare in the Badlands. As he sealed the carcass in the game pouch, Rafe checked the position of the sun. Nearly noon now. A storm heading elsewhere blew eastward in the far north. Dark gray clouds rolled across the horizon like smoke from the distant fire. Rafe shivered. The great want lay to the north. Temp said that if a storm didn't begin in the want, then it sure as stone would end there. Hey, Roughjaw, get your bow over here and let's shred some wood. Dre sent an expertly pitched stone skittering off rocks and hummocks to land with a devilish skip precisely at Rafe's feet. Or are you scared your lucky streak just ended? Almost against his will, Rafe's hand rose to his chin. His skin felt as bristly as a frozen pine cone. He was roughjaw, all right. No argument there. Paint the target, Severance Kerr. Then I'll let you take a hand's worth of practice shots while I restring my bow for wood. Even a hundred paces in the distance, Rafe saw Dre's jaw drop. Restring my bow for wood was exactly the sort of high-blown thing a master bowman would say. Rafe could hardly keep from laughing out loud. Ignoring the insult and boasting, Dre snorted loudly and began plucking fistfuls of grass from the tundra. By the time Rafe caught up with him, Dre had smeared the grass over the trunk of his frost-killed pine, forming a roughly circular target, wet with snowmelt and grass sap. Dre shot first. Stepping back 150 paces, he held his bow at arm's length. 
Dre's bow was a recurve made of winter-cut yew, dried over two full years, and hand-tilled to reduce shock. Rafe envied him for it. His own bow was a clan hand-down, used by anyone who had the string to brace it. Dre took his time sighting his bow. He had a sure, unshakable grip and the strength to hold the string for as long as his ungloved fingers could bear. Just when Rafe was set to call shot due, his brother released the string. The arrow landed with a dull thunk, dead center of the smeared on target. Churning, Dre inclined his head at his younger brother. He did not smile. Rafe's bow was already in hand, his arrow already chosen. With Dre's arrow shaft still quivering in the target, Rafe sighted his bow. The pine was long dead. Cold. When Rafe tried to call it to him, as he had with the ice hair, it wouldn't come. The wood stood its distance. Rafe felt nothing. No quickening of his pulse. No dull pain behind his eyes. No metal tang in his mouth. Nothing. The target was just a target. Unsettled, Rafe centered his bow and searched for the still line that would lead his arrow home. Seeing nothing but a faraway tree, Rafe released his string. Straight away, he knew the shot was bad. He'd been gripping the handle too tightly, and his fingertips had grazed the string on release. The bow shot back with a thwack, and Rafe's shoulder took a bad recoil. The arrow landed a good two hands lower than the target. Shoot again. Dre's voice was cold. Rafe massaged his shoulder, then selected a second arrow. For luck, he brushed the fletchlings against the raven lore he wore on a cord around his neck. The second shot was better, but it still hit thumb's length short of dead center. Rafe turned to look at his brother. It was his shot. Dre made a small motion with his bow. Again, Rafe shook his head. No, it's your turn. Dre shook his own head right back. You sent those two wide on purpose. Now shoot. No, I didn't. It was a true shot. I... No one heart kills three hairs on the run, then misses a target as big as a man's chest. No one. Dre pushed back his foxhood. His eyes were dark. He spat out the wad of black curd he'd been chewing. I don't need mercy shots. Either shoot with me fair, or not at all. Looking at his brother, seeing his big hands pressing hard into the wood of his bow, and the whiteness of his thumbs as he worked on an imagined imperfection, Rafe knew words would not get him nowhere. Dre Severance was 18 years old, a yearman in the clan. This past summer, he'd taken to braiding his hair with black leather strips and wearing a silver earring in his ear. Last night around the fire pit, when Dagro Blackhale had burned the scum off the old malt and dropped his earring into the clear liquor remaining, Dre had done the same. All the sworn clansmen had. Metal next to the skin attracted frostbite, and everyone in the clan had seen the black nubs of unidentifiable flesh that the bite left behind. You could find many willing to tell the story of how John Marrow's member had frozen solid when he was jumped by Doonsmen while he was relieving himself in the brack. By the time he had seen the dunesmen off and pulled himself up from the nail-hard tundra, his manhood was frozen like a cache of winter meat. By all accounts, he hadn't felt a thing until he was brought into the warmth of the roundhouse, and the stretched and shiny flesh began to thaw. His screams had kept the clan awake all night. Rafe ran his hand along the bowstring, warming the wax. If Dre needed to see him take a third shot to prove he wasn't shaming, then take another shot he would. He'd lost the desire to fight. Again, Rafe tried to call the dead tree to him, searching for the still line that would guide his arrow to the heart. Although the blackstone pine had perished ten hunting seasons earlier, it had hardly withered at all. Only the needles were missing. The pitch in the trunk preserved the crown, and the cold dryness of badlands hindered the growth of fungus beneath the bark. Tem said that the great want trees took hundreds, sometimes thousands of years to decay. Seconds passed as Rafe centered on the target. The longer he held his sights, the deader the tree seemed. Something was missing. Ice hairs were real living things. Rafe felt their warmth in the space between his eyes. He imagined the load of hot, pulsing blood in their hearts and saw the still line that linked those hearts to his arrowhead, as clearly as a dog sees his leash. Slowly, Rafe was coming to realize that still line meant death. Frustration finally got the better of him, and he stopped searching for the inner heart of the target and centered his sights on the visual heart instead. With the fletchlings of Dre's arrows in his eye line, Rafe released the shot. The moment his thumb lifted from the string, a raven cawed, high and shrill. The carrion feeder's cry seemed to split the very substance of time. Rafe felt a finger of ice tap his spine. His vision blurred. Saliva jetted into his mouth, thick and hot, tasting of metal. Stumbling back, he lost his grip on the bow. It fell to the ground point first. A crack sounded as it landed. The arrow hit the tree with a dull thud placing a knuckle short of Dre's own shot. Rafe didn't care. Black points raced across his vision, scorching like soot belched from a fire. Rafe! Rafe! Rafe felt Dre's huge muscular arms clamp around his shoulders, smelled his brother's scent of Neat's foot oil, tanned leather, horses, and sweat. 
Glancing up, Rafe saw Dre's brown eyes staring into his. He looked worried. His prize Yubo lay flat on the ground. Here, sit. Not waiting for any compliance on Rafe's part, Dre forced his younger brother onto the tundra floor. The frozen earth bit into Rafe's buckskin pants. Turning away from his brother, Rafe cleared his mouth of the metal-tasting saliva. His eyes stung. A sickening pain in his forehead made him wretch. He clenched his jaw until bone clicked.